Okay, well, they, they uh, assured me people would stop uh, and pay attention, so I thank you all for taking uh, the next 60 seconds out, although I, I guess we'll probably be a little bit longer than that. And I learned early on from one of my great mentors, Gary Larson, you should always bring a spare brain, uh, especially if it's exam time, so we'll use this as a prop during this, uh, this talk. So it seems apropos to be here talking about how we make decisions the day after uh, the presidential primary uh, in Pennsylvania, and so I think probably you all have a lot of interesting questions about what the heck is going on uh, in your brains when people are making decisions. Now, the science of decision making goes back uh, thousands of years. Uh, it began with philosophers and continued with economists and psychologists, and over the last 10 or 15 years, neuroscientists have begun to team up with all the above to try to provide a really mechanistic understanding of what goes on in your brain when we make a decision. So let's imagine that you are uh, coming up to a traffic light, okay? You're, you're driving to work, and you have to decide whether the light is yellow or red, and then you're gonna take a course of action. Now that, uh, that decision could be very simple if it's a nice sunny day, the signals are clear. If you're driving in the fog, of course, that's a much more difficult decision. Now the way the brain actually goes about doing that is that incoming sensory information, the back of the brain flows to parts of the brain that perform the mathematical function of integration. So they do exactly what uh, Alan Turing uh, told the Allied code breakers to do when they were trying to figure out where German submarines are. So he said what you should do is take a sample from the incoming data and put it in a bucket. You put it in the red bucket if the sample favors an interpretation that the light is red. You put it in the yellow, the yellow bucket if it favors the interpretation that the light is yellow. When one bucket fills up, then you say, aha, the light is red. Okay, let's put on the brakes. Now you could imagine that when it's a foggy day, those buckets fill up a lot more slowly. It takes a lot longer to make that decision and you're a lot less confident in your decision as well. And that's exactly what we see happening in these brain areas. These neurons, brain cells in these areas integrate to a threshold that reflects that level of the bucket tipping and favoring uh, one interpretation of the world over another. Now, of course, once you've figured out whether the light is red or the light is yellow, you have to decide what to do about it. And we now know that there are parts of the brain that seem to compute what the economists call utility, and that is a boiled down signal that reflects all the various uh, influences on your decision. How valuable is it for you to get to work? How much risk is there uh, in running into another car? How uh, how often have you been late to work, et cetera. And there's a part of the brain right here in the middle, okay, that's particularly important for making that utility computation. Once you've computed the utility of the different options, in this case, uh, pressing the gas pedal or hitting the brakes, then that information influences parts of the brain that are involved in actually selecting a motor response, that is, making an action. Now, the job of the brain is not done. Once you've made a decision and you've committed to a response, hit the gas or hit the brakes. We are intelligent creatures and we learn from our actions. We learn from our decisions. And there is another system of the brain that actually computes the outcome of that decision in terms of whether it was better or worse than you thought. So did you get through the light? Did you make it to work? Or did you run into the car that was coming the other way? That error signal then flows throughout the brain and helps to update our interpretations, our representations of the state of the world and the value of taking different courses of action uh, once, we've, um, once we've seen that state of the world. Now at this moment in intellectual history, we are really poised to begin using this information potentially in our daily lives. In fact, it is now possible to use neuroscience not as a tool to understand how the brain works, but it is a tool to let us uh, change the way that we, say, present information to other people. So, for example, we can now measure how much you value something just by scanning your brain before you've made a choice, before perhaps you're even aware of that preference. That's a really amazing thing. It presents potentially uh, a business opportunity. We can help businesses to press that buy button a little harder, get you to make a purchase. Uh, it's also potentially a consumer risk, I think, as you can well appreciate. So uh, with that, uh, I hope you now have an appreciation of uh, the current state of the knowledge of how our brains make decisions. Thank you.